Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this session of Grand Rounds. I'd like to welcome our presenter for today, Dr. Alan Junkins, who will be presenting on the topic of surgical specimens and microbiology. At this time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn the presentation over to Dr. Junkins. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. Um, let me make sure I got this. Are we good? Can you see? Can't see anything just yet, Dr. Jenkins. You can't. Okay, I screwed something up here. There, okay. There we go. Took a while. I'm having to do this on a different computer today. Are we good now? Looks well, perfect. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about surgical specimens today. Uh, and it's really kind of like specimen collection in general, but, but particularly with regards to surgery, because that's where we really have maybe not the biggest problem with specimen collection, but uh, the one that bothers us the most. Um, no, I can't go. There we go. So you've seen things like this before, the old computer algorithm kind of thing, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you put garbage into the situation, whatever your analysis pipeline is, uh, what you're going to get out is not really going to be uh, of any great use to us. And you can look at the same thing here with the laboratory. The specimen, if it's a garbage specimen going in, the best micro lab in the world is not going to be able to overcome a bad specimen. You're still going to get a result that's going to be questionable at best, outright wrong uh, at worst. Uh, so we don't want to mislead. The most important thing that we need to do is make sure we get an appropriate specimen. And I can go on about specimen collection for all kinds of different specimens. Uh, but I want to talk about surgical specimens in particular today, because when we think of surgery, you know, we, we think this should be easy. You're going in, you're being very sterile, and you're cutting in, you know, you're taking something out that normally has no normal floor whatsoever. It's all very careful, very controlled. Um, it should be very easy for us to interpret. We should be able to look at the plate and say, if something's growing, it's important. Now, I have never performed surgery on a human. Um, but I've seen the TV shows and they all look like this. You know, it's all very careful, lots of washing, lots of sterilization or disinfecting the skin, autoclaving your supplies. Everything's very nice and sterile. Uh, so that's really what we kind of expect. So if I have a culture that looks like this and I'm saying this was surgically collected, then I'm thinking everything should be clinically significant. I should be able to look at that bug clinically significant. This one here is important. That one is important. That one is important. So do we work up, identify, and do susceptibility on four different organisms? Or do we look at this and say, you know what? That really looks like scant growth of skin flora. Uh, and if we're told that this is a surgically collected specimen, I don't expect to see that skin flora. So we are stuck in, in the lab sometimes with these difficult decisions to make. Do we, do we work all those up? Do we report those bugs and possibly create an antimicrobial stewardship night, nightmare for our pharmacy friends? Or do we say, no, this is just scan growth of normal skin flora. We don't think any of this is clinically important. Uh, and then hope, <laughs> hope for the best when it comes to the patient treatment. So here's the other problem with surgical specimens. It's a big range. I mean, every single part of your body could be a surgical specimen. There's a whole lot of different specimen types that are that are covered in that. And even though we're talking about, you know, disinfecting the skin and cutting through into a patient uh, and going um, to take something that we normally would expect to be sterile, surgery often involves manipulation of mucosal surfaces of, of the GI, uh, gastrointestinal tract, uh, of course, of the skin. So contamination with normal flora can occur, even if it is just, even if it is surgically required. And the other thing is that they're difficult to explain, uh, to obtain specimens. You know, 
we're not going to go in and say, you know, that liver biopsy that you sent us, uh, could you go send us some more? Can you go get some more of that? So if you send us a bad urine, urine that was not collected very well or urine that was not transported very well, you're going to get a comment that looks something like this. Lots of mixed flora, multiple organisms suggest appropriate recollection. It's a urine you can recollect, do a better job. If it's a sputum, we gram stain it, we saw lots of squamous epithelial cells. We, this is not a sputum. This has got too much contamination with the upper respiratory tract. We reject it and we say recollect if clinically indicated. And even some things like this, you know, just about anything. This is a nice, simple, sweet comment. Collect, cancel, specimen in the wrong tube, recollect. So most specimen types like that, we can kind of say, um, if this is not a good specimen, we just won't culture it uh, or, or we won't report it, any bugs from it, uh, go and recollect it. I can't do that in a surgical specimen. I can't really reject it because it's a poor specimen. I might be able to reject it because it's a completely useless specimen, and those do occur, but we can't really reject it because it's a poor specimen. We have to take the poor specimens as they come. Um, so it's a very high stake situation. Uh, a surgeon is going in to collect this specimen. It's not an easy specimen to collect. Surgical staff have to make sure that it is well collected and well transported uh, because that's your one shot at it. You're not gonna get more shots. So just a quick question, you know, how many surgeons do we have listening today? Um, I won't show, if, if we were all together in one room, I'd ask for a show of hands, but I'm kind of figuring the answer is none. Uh, and so this, to a certain extent, is not really aimed at you guys. You guys are going to have to listen to me rant for a little while here uh, about what we want to see in surgically, surgically collected specimens. And it really applies to any specimen at all. But like I said, the stakes are higher when it comes to, to surgery. So some key points when we're talking about surgical collection. Avoid normal flora as much as possible. This diagram is supposed to show all the different parts of the body where there is normal flora. Obviously, everything that's exposed to the outside, that's the skin, but that's also the entire upper respiratory tract. This diagram even has the lungs, which is sort of true, sort of true. There's some transient flora in the lungs, at least. Uh, of course, the whole GI tract, the whole urinary tract, the genital tract have got mucosal surfaces that have lots and lots of normal flora. Try, need, we need to avoid that as much as possible. A lot of times in surgical site infection, not surgical site infection, but infections where you're going in um, to collect something surgically, it, it, the cause is a bug that is a normal flora organism on that mucosal surface and it gets to some place where it's not supposed to go. You know, there's a breach in the intestinal tract and the bug gets behind those epithelial cells and causes an infection back there. So if we get a lot of normal flora, we, we can't really interpret that and say whether this is just contamination with normal flora or is this a normal flora organism that has gotten someplace. Surgeon, you collected the specimen well, but it's a bug that is a, normally a normal flora bug that just got someplace where it wasn't supposed to be. So we need to avoid contamination with those mucosal surfaces or the skin surfaces as much as possible so that the, the microbiologist in the laboratory can kind of look at it and say, okay, this, this looks like a clinically significant organism, not just contamination. Avoid the normal flora. And we really want that, <clears throat> like I said, in any specimen. Obviously, you can't do that in specimens that we're actually sampling the mucosal surface, uh, but uh, otherwise we would really like to avoid not to deal with normal flora. Here's the biggie, uh, and we are you will see micro labs all over the country, all over the world that will complain about this. What we want is tissue. If you're going to go in to collect tissue during surgery, we want the tissue. We do not want a swab of the tissue. We want a specimen, not a swab of a specimen. Tissue is what we want to get, okay? Uh, and <clears throat> we will fuss about this all the time. I'll, I'll tell you some of the reasons here. These are a couple of the swabs that are commercially available. Use 
quite frequently. The, the uh, BD culture swabs or remel uh, back T swabs on the left side, the kind of tr traditional rayon swabs. <clears throat> if you ever look at those things, you know, that, that rayon tip is really wrapped pretty tight. Uh, it's hard for specimen to really get in there. And as a result, they don't hold much. I've seen numbers ranging from 50 to 150 microliters of specimen that actually get attached onto that swab if you were to swab a surface. The other problem with those is that a lot of organisms, particularly hydrophobic organisms, particularly the acid fast bacilli, who they attach to those rayon fibers and don't like to be released. So it's really hard for them to come up. These swabs here are absolutely, totally a no-go for fungal or AFB uh, infections. Can't, really should not do it at all. On the right side, you have the flock swabs. The flock swabs are newer. They are much, much better. They hold more specimen and they release more organism. Once you put them in that fluid, they're going to release a lot more of the organism. They're still bad for surgical specimens. The ones on the left, terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. The ones on the right are a little bit better. They're still bad, but they're a little bit better. We don't want swabs. Uh, I can't tell you, you know, there have been times when um, we'll, we'll get a specimen that comes in, it's on a swab, and they, they went into surgery, and they'd opened up this patient, and they saw the site of the infection, and they stuck a swab in it. Uh, and you're like, just, just send us send us the actual site of the infection. These are some slides that were made up by Nancy Cornish. She was at Creighton University at the time. She's at the CDC now. She made these uh, little posters that she put up all over the place and sent them all over the country. So you, you may have seen these uh, in, in laboratories all over the place. Um, swabs don't do the job. Um, I'm not sure where she gets these numbers. Out of every 100 bacteria absorbed in swab, only three make it on the culture. Not sure where that came from, but you know, I, I'll trust her. Uh, so for quality results and tissue and fluids, here's a good one. Make the right choice. Good specimens, tissue and whole fluid. If you're going to go in and drain something, give us some fluid. Uh, we want the fluid. Uh, bad specimens are anything on a swab. Uh, anything on a swab we don't want. Uh, and this is a good one too here. Uh, Effective culture requires six plates, one broth tube, and one gram stain. I'm not sure exactly where she gets that from, but yes, there are times when we will get a swab with requests for bacterial culture and fungal culture, sometimes AFB culture. Uh, and you'll say, after I start swabbing the plates, after I'm done swabbing the plates for the bacterial culture, there's no specimen left to do the fungal culture or the AFB culture. So it's just not enough material. It's not a good source. Don't do swabs. There's a little official confirmation of this too. We have the uh, uh, American Society of Clinical Pathology backing us up here. This is from their Choosing Wisely campaign. So this has been out for a while now. I think it's, I think it's actually choosingwisely.org that you can go to to give you all these little rules uh, in healthcare about what you should be doing and what you should not be doing. Uh, and they say in here, do not generally, I don't know why they put generally in there, but do not generally use swabs to collect specimens from microcultures on specimens from the operating room. And they give you all the reasons there I just kind of mentioned, including more likely to be contaminated with normal flora and not enough material on the swab. So here's a good thing to kind of keep in mind. I think this is a good rule of thumb that we would, I would like to tell our surgeons, I know, you know, I know you guys probably don't do a whole lot of surgery yourself, uh, but this is what I would like to sit down and tell all the surgeons around. Here's a good thing to keep in mind. Send micro the same stuff that you would send the pathology. Uh, I think a lot of surgeons kind of think, you know, I'm going to collect a, a big piece of, of tissue, of, of liver. I'm going to send the tissue to pathology because they need the tissue, obviously. Uh, and I'll send a little piece or I'll send a swab of it to micro because micro doesn't need as much. Micro is just gonna put it on a plate to see what grows. That's not true. Micro actually needs more tissue than pathology does. Pathology is gonna cut off a little piece 
put it in a tissue block uh, and take a look at it. It would be nice if micro actually had more tissue than pathology does. So just think of it that way. Whatever it is you would send to pathology, send it, send the same stuff to micro. Uh, and I have to put the caveat down here, don't put it in formula. Uh, that is one thing that will get your surgical specimen rejected by micro. If it comes in formalin, there's no point doing the culture. The bug is dead if there was a bug there in the first place. Uh, we have gotten, you know, I remember a, a month or so ago, we got a nice uh, tube, just a plain tube with a piece of tissue in it uh, that reeked of formalin. Uh, it wasn't sitting in formalin, but it smelled like formalin. And so when we called the, the nurse who sent it, yeah, they put it in formalin and then realized their mistake. So they fished it out uh, and put it in a plain tube. And we're like, well, uh, no, not going to do it. Not going to do it. So send us the same tissue that you would send to pathology. Here's another key point. Send enough for all the tests that are ordered. Uh, this uh, one on the right side here, that top right there, that is a specimen that we actually got last week. Uh, and if you look at that little dot that's underneath the A in China, uh, that is a little piece of tissue. Uh, the other stuff over there is just like bloody fluid. Uh, so there is a little tiny piece of tissue in there. Uh, I don't know, a couple of millimeters across. Uh, and that came with orders for an aerobic, anaerobic culture, a fungal culture, and an AFB culture. Uh, that's not really enough to do any one of those. So we're kind of stuck in a bind there where we say we can do three cultures all poorly, all very poorly, or we can do uh, one culture poorly and um, cancel the other two, reject it for the other two. Uh, so that involves trying to get a hold of the surgeon and trying to see what is most critical in this case. I put the one in the bottom just because it's gross. It's really cool looking. I pulled this out just the other day to show you what we do like to get. This is a drainage from an abdominal abscess. So they stuck a needle in, sucked it out of this big 30 mil syringe and just sent us the whole syringe. Uh, that, that's what we want to get. Uh, that was plenty for us to do. However many tests you want to do, we will manage with it. So that was what we want. Um, I, I tell you, I have seen situations before where, where uh, doctors will call me up after the fact and say, we want to add some test onto that plural fluid that was collected. And I'll look at it and say, well, I can't because what they did is they sent us a swab uh, and and the, doc, the infectious disease doc usually will say, well, come on, they told me they drained a, a liter of, of pleural fluid off this patient. Well, they drained a liter off and stuck a swab in it and sent us the swab. Uh, and I don't know what they did with the rest of it, but they didn't send it to my group. So um, send enough, send enough. Uh, we don't care if we get a big bucket. We have in the past gotten big buckets full of organs uh, for culture. Now, we're okay with that. We're good with that. It's really pretty cool. You know, um, so don't be throwing tissue away. Send it to us. Now, what we want, what we're going to culture is going to be the part of the tissue that looks infected, that inflamed, looks like there's necrotic tissue or something like that. Um, we would like to get that material. Uh, if you send us the whole organ we will search around and try to find the part that looks the grungiest. And we have to get to, tr to transport as well. Uh, I've already mentioned don't do informal, and I got to put that in there again, just because. Um, the other things is you don't want it to dry out. You don't want to put a little piece of tissue in a, in a cup like this. Uh, it's going to dry out very quickly, and when it dries, bugs are going to die. Now, Different bugs will survive that longer than others. Um, for example, you know, a group A strep will actually survive drying for a long time. Uh, a group B strep is going to die pretty quickly. So, it, it, you know, we don't know what the bug is. Uh, if, if it dries out and nothing grows, that doesn't tell us anything. And even if you're not ordering an anaerobic culture, 
if you're sending this to us as like a tissue specimen, make sure it's still transported in a way that is appropriate for anaerobes, because a lot of those surgical specimens we're going to put in that broth to look for anaerobes anyway, even if it was not ordered. So a tissue culture, for example, gets put in a broth. A body fluid culture gets put in a broth. So even if you don't ask for anaerobes, we will, we will include a broth that will grow anaerobes just in case. So some examples of what you can do here. This is just a plain sterile uh, you know, specimen cup. This is fine for fairly, fairly good sizes of tissue. If you've got a tissue that's like more than a cubic centimeter, for example, uh, it can just go in there as it is. If it's a, vol if it's a fluid that you've got 10, 20 mils of fluid, it can just go in there. If it gets to the laboratory within a reasonable time frame, then it's not going to lose anaerobes. Anaerobes will still be viable in there during that time. If it's going to take 12 hours a, a day to get to the laboratory, then that's a problem. Um, these are great. These are anaerobic transport media. Uh, some labs have these, some labs don't. We don't use them here. Uh, I would like to, but um, we, we don't. We just never have. This top is a, a uh, little vial that will hold a piece of tissue. There's a gel here uh, in the bottom of it that's going to contain reducing agents that will mop up all the oxygen. So you can open the top here, stick your tissue in, stick the tissue down underneath this gel, close the top. Now, you've let air in when you had that top off, but the reducing agents in that gel are going to kind of suck up the oxygen that's in there. And it's going to make a nice, fairly anaerobic um, system there for, to transport that specimen. This so one on the bottom is the same kind of thing, but this is used for body fluids. So if you're going to suck off some Paris meal fluid or something, uh, then you can inject it. Neil, this is a rubber septum. Inject it right through uh, into this. This is anaerobic inside, and it's got this gel that contains those uh, reducing agents. So. This would be a good way to send uh, any kind of tissue or fluid from, from surgery. And what I tell people, I know I said no swabs. So you look at this picture here, just pretend the swabs aren't there, okay? These are the flock swabs, the e-swabs uh, that we commonly use for other specimen sources. The medium that they have in there is good for anaerobic transport. So what I like to tell people is if you've got a, a tissue that's going to fit in this tube, then take to open the pack, take the swab, throw the swab away, put your tissue down in that liquid. And that's going to serve as an anaerobic transport medium. Uh, if the tissue is too big to fit in that tube, great. Just put it in a cup. That will be good enough to maintain anaerobic environment inside that tissue uh, as long as we get it within a reasonable time frame. So there's a few ways to, to transport. Got to transport it well because uh, transportation can, can mess things up. Uh, lastly here, my, my next piece of rant is we want to get enough information about the specimen to help micro interpret the results. Um, we we want to get enough information about it. We want to know that it is collected surgically, uh, if that's possible. And we want to know where it's from. So, for example, how does the lab know that the specimen was actually collected surgically? There's nothing here. This is a report that we got. Um, um, when was this? Last week. Um, and there's a few hints here. One is the location. So, for us, we can look at it and say, this is B periop. This is the periop unit at Brownsburg Hospital. So, I can look at that and say, okay. Um, that was collected surgically. Unfortunately, we have, as of a couple of days ago when I checked, 1,344 different units uh, that we get orders from. Uh, we don't know which one of those, how many of those are surgical units, how many of those are non-surgical units. It's, it's not gonna be apparent sometimes. We can also look at uh, the physician. This is Dr. Sharp. We know that Dr. Sharp is one of our surgeons. So we are going to assume that this is surgically collected, although Dr. Sharp does send us other things that are not surgically collected. Uh, but that's a hint. And that works great in a small hospital 
where you know the doctors, where you know all the doctors. Um, if you if you don't know all of them, then it becomes a much more problem. The order itself is a hint too. This is not much of a hint for us. This you just ordered a an anaerobic aerobic culture of this, which is kind of standard practice. We do not have an order for surgical specimen or surgical specimen culture. We don't have that. Most of the surgical specimens that we get are ordered as an anaerobic aerobic culture. Uh, some of them are, are body fluid culture. Some of them are not. Some of them we think they order as a wound culture or something else like that. So sometimes we know it's surgically collected. Sometimes we don't know. And that is going to affect the interpretation. And next thing is, where is it actually from? Give as much information as possible about where you actually got this specimen. I'm showing you this table. This is the last uh, couple months of abscess specimens. All of these were labeled as abscess. And if you go in and look, that, that abscess doesn't help us a whole lot. Uh, first of all, some abscesses are gonna be surgically collected, some are not. I can look at this and say, okay, the brain abscess, I'm pretty certain that was surgically collected. Uh, but a labial abscess, a perirectal abscess, you know, not so much. I don't don't know if that is or is not. You can see from the units there, the, the surgical units are the ones that I could tell that is a surgical unit. That's one of those periop units or something. Uh, but a lot of these were collected uh, just on the floor in one of the regular units. Um, and a lot of them were ordered in an outpatient setting, in an immediate care center, in a physician office uh, setting. So don't really know how those were collected. And here's the really thing that we really like, other. Notice that we had more other than anything else. Um, doesn't help us a whole lot to, to help interpret that, whether it's other or not. But you can obviously see here that in these cases, if I get something from a brain abscess or a liver abscess, I'm thinking anything is clinically important. If I get something from a labial abscess or a pararectal abscess, there could very well be a lot of normal flora there as well. Uh, if I get something from an other abscess, I have no idea what we're going to do with that. So, oh, 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 and this is my favorite. And those of you who are at Norton facilities right now, enjoy this while you can because these are going away. Uh, we have a specimen source that's called Surge S, surgical swab. And we have ones called Surge TIS, surgical tissue. Sometimes they'll come to us just labeled surgical swab, and I'll have, I have no idea what this is. First of all, it's a swab. Secondly, I have no idea where it came from. Uh, we are in the process of getting rid of those, so nobody can be able to order those again. So let me give you a few examples here just at the very end here. This is the same picture I showed you earlier with the four different bugs growing on it. And I'm kind of like, how should our interpretation, if this is a wound culture, this is a wound culture labeled left arm, but I'm going to look at that and say, that looks pretty much like normal skin flora. And I'm going to call that normal skin flora. Now, if it's a tissue culture, notice it's still labeled left arm. It's still coming from the same place, but it's called a tissue instead of a wound. All right. Normally with a tissue, I would say I'm going to work up everything here. Um, I'm going to look at that. That becomes difficult there to say, I don't know. I don't know whether this is still skin tissue, because certainly if you go and surgically collect this tissue from somebody's arm, there's a possibility of contamination with skin flora. Now, if it's a tissue culture that's labeled brain, then I'm going to look at that and say, I've got to work up every single one of those bugs. I've got to give you susceptibility on every single one of those bugs. Um, so knowing what it is and where it's from and how it was collected completely changes how micro is going to work it up and what results you're gonna get back. Here, here's another one. I don't have any uh, types of specimens for this one, but if you look at that, again, um, I'm looking at that thinking that looks like normal skin flora, but it depends where it came from. There's at least two organisms there that I can see, maybe three. Um, kind of depends on where it's from. Here's a good one too here. This one actually was labeled a toe. Now, I don't know, you guys, uh, you know, microbiologists will tell you the grossest body part is 
anything below the ankle. The toe and the foot are the grossest. Uh, you know, give me sputum, give me poop any day. Uh, toes and feet are, are kind of microbiologically gross. This one is actually not too bad. There are three organisms here. They're all heavy growth. You can kind of see one, two, and then this guy down here. They're all heavy growth. Um, if it's, it, what do we call that? Are we going to call that heavy growth normal toe flora, no, normal skin flora? Uh, uh, if it's surgically collected, uh, do we have to go in and we work it up and say, okay, no, this, this all needs to be reported by name with susceptibility results done. Uh, this one was not a surgical specimen, and it was reported as heavy growth skin flora. But if, if this had been collected in surgery, if somebody had gone in and, you know, we're not, we don't know exactly what the nature of the infection was when we have to make these decisions. Um, so um, there's a situation where uh, wound culture versus tissue culture, surgically collected versus not surgically collected, uh, again, makes a big difference. So just getting back to the beginning here, like I said, garbage in, garbage out. But with surgery, you know, high stakes. You, you don't go in to have surgery. I, I can tell you this, if, if, I, if somebody put me under and did surgery on me and came back three days later and said, the micro lab didn't like your specimen. So uh, we need to go in and do it all over again. You know, yeah, sure. I'd, I'd be kind of ticked off, especially, you know, if I, how much I paid for that surgery, I'd do it again. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's high stakes. We have to make sure we have really good specimen collection because we don't want to reject it. We don't want to reject a specimen that was difficult to obtain. Uh, the only situation where we might really do that, if it, if you this specimen is completely destroyed, uh, you put it in formula. Okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna do that culture. Okay, but even if we look at it and say this was a poorly collected specimen, even if we knew that ahead of time this is a poorly collected specimen, we're not gonna give up on it. You know, honestly, this you go in and do a real surgery and bring, give me a tissue specimen from a real surgery, and it happens to sit in the tube station for two days, uh, and then you send it to micro. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up on it. I, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. I might put a disclaimer on it saying this sat in the tube station at room temperature for two days, uh, but it's irretrievable. We have to have it available, uh, and so. For all micro, and especially for uh, surgical specimens, specimen collection, good quality collection, good quality uh, transport is the only way you're going to get good specimens. All right. I am done. Any uh, Anything to add or fuss about? Or Anything? Hey, Alan. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so, when you when you were showing those slides about the um, the optimal amount of plates you need for for the culture, you said it was six. And were you saying that's that's for all surgical specimens, or that's like um, no, no, I, no. First of all, that was Nancy saying that. It wasn't me. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, it depends on the type of specimen. So a, a surgical specimen, if it's a tissue specimen, we're going to put onto four plates and a tube. Uh, now, if they also also ask for fungal culture, that's a couple more plates. Uh, so it, it depends on what all has been ordered on that. Yeah. There's, no, there's no type of routine bacterial culture that we use six plates on. Uh -huh. I think four is probably the most. Four in a broth is probably the most that we do on any single type of culture. Yeah. But but you'll, they'll often, you know, if you're going in there and you're getting this out, it was hard to get. They'll they'll typically order bacterial, fungal, and AFB. Sometimes they'll order viral culture, which I don't know why, but sometimes mm -hmm. they will. Yeah, I guess uh, that's potentially something we could look at. Um, so, I mean, if we're if we're ordering all these cultures and a lot of them, if we're not suspecting a fungal infection or a mycobacterial infection, but then we're essentially wasting some of the tissue that's like scarce, 
uh, and not able to do bacterial culture where we'd be more suspicious or suspicious for that's potentially affecting our ability to get a microbiological diagnosis. Yeah, it is. It, it kind of depends on, on uh, honestly, I hate to say this, but it kind of depends on the person in processing here in micro who gets that specimen because, you know, and it depends what time of the day or night it is. You know, if it's a situation where we can call the surgeon or somebody, the infectious disease doctor, and say, we don't have enough here. So pick, pick the one test that is really important, then we can do that. But on the other hand, if it's 11 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you have somebody who just wants to get their job done here, then they may say, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and do everything that, that's been ordered, you know, and it's, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes exactly what the best option is to do. Yeah. Less is more, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't want to, in, in those overnight specimens, I don't want a situation where we say, well, we're just not going to do anything until we have a chance to talk to, to somebody about it. You know, sometimes you have to do that. Appreciate it. Yep. Dr. Jenkins, this is Angie. I have a question. When they um, select other as the source, is there yeah. an epic? to um to put a comment so that they can add what the other is i just we see that a lot from an ip standpoint um and i just don't i don't really know what the barriers are for one why they're selecting other or if there's a, an option to add a comment uh there there is an option there's there's a comment field whenever you order a test in, in epic there's a comment field that you can put in put in comments and a lot of times they will do that uh it, it's not really very visible to us on the lab and to, to look at those comments, but sometimes we can we can get into Epic and take a look at it and find out what it is. If it's if it's really an issue where we're trying to figure out what to do here and we're you know feeling angst about it, then then we can get into Epic and, and figure that out. Now, one of the good things is um, we are in the process of switching from SunQuest to Epic Beaker as our lab information system. Epic Beaker does not allow other. So you will not see the others in, in 18 months, hopefully, when we are up on Epic Beaker, then you won't see others like that. They'll, they'll have to pick something. Um, that's going to cause another set of problems because uh, it's difficult to sit there and list every single type of abscess that's possible. Um, but we'll, we'll figure it out. You know, it, I, I would like to be able to say that micro has the time uh, to to investigate all of these specimens that we we work up like that. Uh, unfortunately, the big lab lab like ours, um, that's that's lean leanly is that a word leanly staffed. Uh, um, you have to pick and choose what you're actually going to uh, spend time researching in Epic. A smaller facility uh, with less of a workload would be able to handle that better. All right, guys, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, um, I invite everybody to come back to the presentation next week, and I look forward to seeing everybody then. Thank you.